It's a theme for this album, Dread. I was super excited when I heard that we're doing a DLC that is going to be themed around the void. I knew that I would get the chance to write like some real dark shit and uh, I was really looking forward to that. Because I was so tired and exhausted by uh, writing Risk of Rain 2 that my, my headspace was just there, was, you know, kind of really looking forward to put down some dark music. This is the album commentary for Survivors of the Void, the companion album, the soundtrack to the DLC. We're gonna go track by track, and I think this time I'm gonna focus on inspiration. So we're listening to Prelude in D-flat major, which is a piece by Frédéric Chopin. This is the last thing that I recorded for the album and actually we're, we're not even sure that we're gonna use it in the game. My initial idea was that I wanted to do this, I wanted to put this down because of the piece that appears last in the album, which is essentially the middle part of this prelude. And it was something that I've written halfway through the process, I think. So I, I felt that it would be a nice way to open the album with this and close the album with that one. So we come, you know, full circle and, and I show my source of inspiration very, you know, I, I put it out there just uh, like front and center. So it's just me playing the piece and uh, having a little bit of, uh, you know, Risk of Rain sounds coming on top of it and all that. And uh, the reason why this particular prelude was chosen is because uh, it has a nickname uh, Raindrop. Uh, it eventually got into the game, which I was happy about, yeah, because I think it's, it's a nice, you know, change of pace from the usual, like, electronica and all that stuff. But yeah, that was Prelude, and now we've moved into uh, the piece called A Placid Island of Ignorance. And with this one, a uh, motive starts for this particular album in which I name all my pieces after some sort of literary or uh, otherwise written reference that has to do either vaguely or directly with music, water, the sea, the rain, stuff like that. So continuing on that, trend of naming my pieces after, you know, water-related stuff, but this time I take it a, a, a step further and go into this pattern of literary references. A Placid Island of Ignorance, a phrase coming from H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu, so it's kind of ob obviously very much related with water, and of course with the theme of dread. So this piece written in 5-8, or bass 5, as I like to call it sometimes. I think of it like a sort of a 4-4 four, four piece, but every beat has five denominations. One, two, three, four, five. 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 And another recurring idea in the album is this callback to uh, music from the original Risk of Rain. So we get here a little bit of a callback from the opening, the intro, the menu music, so to speak, of Risk of Rain 1. If you notice in the background, this little motive is from a dream theater piece called the Rotomania from their album Awake. It's not going to be the last reference to dream theater in this album. In fact, there's a piece that is essentially a tribute to dream theater. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a piece that is written in five 
and I love it very much and it's an instrumental piece and I thought okay I have this five motive all over Risk of Rain 2 let's let's bring in some stuff you know let's 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 experiment a little bit again here in the chiptune sound and now a new thing is introduced This piece is kind of written to be a little bit off-putting, to be confusing. So on top of this five bass weird 4-4, we get this now theme that is not really, you know, stepping firmly on the beat. So you, you have to grasp on something to, to keep uh, your place in the meter. And as usual, things start to ramp up. This is one of my favorite pieces in the album because it really, really goes really dark and imposing. To me, this part is kind of a tribute to just video game music from the past. It feels very video gamey. It reminds me of games I used to play on my Master System or stuff like that. Another thing that is kind of a repeating pattern in the album is that a lot of the tracks don't really have a B part. They have like interludes or stuff like that, but essentially there's just one idea. And this is for two reasons. The w one of the reasons is that I really didn't have a lot of time to compose very meticulously and do B parts and bridges and all that stuff. And that I knew that I had very, very little time to compose all the music. So I thought instead of doing, you know, very elaborate compositions like that, I'll try to, to work in a way that Essentially, I consider the entire album like one continuous piece of music, so th this is how it goes. So we moved on to the third piece, Haven't Fallen, It Was Blood. This is uh, from a poem by Edgar Allan Poe. It's called Silence, a Fable. Uh, by the way, all these references, if you uh, watch the videos on YouTube that are the pieces, uh, the beginning of each video has these references written out, so you can find them, find out where they're from, and, and read them extensively, because I'm including, you know, like, previous parts and stuff. Uh, and this is essentially a piece, this is a boss fight piece that is heavily, heavily relying on uh, the, the rhythm section from Hailstorm. Essentially what I did is I just brought the entire stuff, I, I went into my Engineer Edition files, brought in the, the drums and stuff, and uh, kind of on top of it I written a new piece. And this is again for two reasons. One, because I had this idea that I'm, I want to call back music from the original album, but it's also because I was really, really precious on time. I really didn't have time, and sometimes I just thought, look, let's let's do the best with, with, with the little time that we've got. And if it means that I have to, you know, kind of rely on something that already exists, so be it. And uh, typical solo stuff, my cl classic guitar sounds from the um, from Risk of Rain 2. What I did and what I always do is that during the writing of an album, some sounds come up. You know, either uh, patches that I create with my synthesizers, amps for guitars, basses, and stuff. 
what have you, and these will become just part of the palette eventually. So I just put down those presets, I save them, and then kind of call them back. And, and essentially you develop this kind of template that has all, all the available sounds. Of course, I'm always open to introducing new ones, but, but after a point, you have, you know, your very foundational palette. So what I'm doing, when I want to play a solo on the guitar or I want to play a solo on the keyboard, I don't create a sound from scratch. I just use the one that, that has been already established uh, in the soundtrack. So this is very much uh, working towards this kind of unified sound. Okay, so let's talk inspiration a little bit. The piece that just started, it's called Out of Whose Womb Came the Ice. I, I really, really, really try to have uh, references that are also work as good titles. I think this is one of my favorite ones. Now, the inspiration for this title is, uh, it comes from the Bible, it's from the book of Job. But how I came upon this, I wasn't, you know, like scanning the Bible for uh, ice or rain or water reference and stuff. How I came upon this, I was reading this book that's called Endurance, and it's about an expedition to the Antarctic that went horribly wrong. Captain Shackleton and his crew went there and they were supposed to cross the continent and meet another expedition that would come from the other way. They went from um, Terra del Fuego and uh, they were supposed to meet some other people that had uh, landed from Australia and they would meet in the middle and stuff. Anyway, it went really horribly wrong. Um, they didn't even essentially start their journey because they were blocked in the ice on their ship and stayed there and tried to survive for a long time. They said, okay, maybe we'll wait, maybe we can break the ice, maybe it will melt. Essentially, the ice crushed their ship, so they had to go on foot and uh, walk with their sleds and take uh, whatever food and stuff they could get. And, and, and it took them, I think, like a year or something. The, the miraculous thing about this expedition is that everyone survived. This is, it's a, absolutely crazy. And this book um, documents th these events from their diaries, from uh, stuff they said when they returned and, and all that stuff. It even has pictures because they had a photographer on board with, with his camera. This, this, by the way, this is something that happened in the beginning of the 20th century. So, you know, we're not talking like high tech stuff. I was reading this book, it's a fascinating book, and when they had to go off the ship and start this journey into the unknown, Captain Shackleton read a part of the Bible, this passage, to them. Uh, he was a religious man, I guess he carried his Bible all the time. This is something that was supposed to be inspirational, in a sense. But it, it just felt so appropriate to use this uh, piece, also because I knew that we were going to have some... Underwater was a theme that we were using in the expansion. Anyway, I, I completely talked over the piece. I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the drumming in the, in the middle there, but still, what I really wanted, wanted to say is that, that I had these titles from the very beginning. It's one of the rare occasions that I started writing um, music after having the titles. And at a lot of the time, I would think of these titles and the images behind them and, uh, and, and all that stuff. And this would really direct the, the music and how, it, how it, I would try to portray these images from these references. Of course, this while always trying to, to stay true to the Risk of Rain sound, because I'm not, I'm not doing a solo album here, it's just a, uh, it's still a video game soundtrack. 
But yeah, it's, it was an interesting uh, experiment. And I actually sometimes uh, would think that, okay, I'm writing a piece for this particular title, but then it would uh, swap down the road because the piece would take a particular direction that, you know, would no longer fit. And this is an example of this. Uh, the, the piece called uh, Once in a Lullaby, um, it was originally and until the very, very last minute almost, like of the recordings and stuff and the production of the piece, it was supposed to be a placid island of ignorance. In fact, the scores, the sheet music that I sent to the violin player and the oboe player, they, they had that title on them, you know, that was the original thing and it swapped at some point. because I felt it just once in a little by was a title that I had and just fit better with the piece. And actually this title is one that I had uh, rejected again at the very last minute for the piece you're gonna need a bigger ukulele from the original Risk of Rain 2 soundtrack. It doesn't fit the piece that much, obviously, so that's why I didn't uh, use it, but I really liked it, uh, so I just wanted to use it. Okay, so, the oboe. Use of the oboe here was something that uh, came really, really at the beginning of writing the piece. In fact, this is the very first piece that I wrote for the DLC. And um, the oboe was something that was there from the very beginning. I had used, you know, a sample library to, to do a mock-up. And eventually I knew that I would want to replace it. I got uh, this player, Christos Tsoyas Razakov, and uh, we did a session here in my studio. He brought his oboe. I knew that he also had an English horn, which is kind of like a a bass version of an oboe, to, to put it very, very uh, in simplistic terms. So the piece here, when the guitar enters, switches to 7-4 from 4-4 four four that was before. This is a piece that the form of it is just one very basic idea that is just keeps building up and up and up and up and becomes this anthem. I knew very early on that I would want to write something like that and um, this idea worked for that. We have here uh, the violin from Calliope Mitropoulou, which is a violin player that I had worked with on uh, the podcast that we did uh, last year called Gospels on the Flood. She's a brilliant violin player. I sent her the score remotely. She sent me a bunch of recordings and I knew that she could also sing. And I told her, hey, can you send me a couple of voices of just doing this melody? And uh, I told her, yeah, you can send me one, that, one that's high, like uh, the high register, the high octave. And she said, it's gonna be high as fuck. And I told her, yeah, no, it's gonna be high as fuck, yeah. You can hear her voice now together with the lead, the, the lead solo synth. So yeah, just building up into this kind of hopefully beautiful 2T that is just kind of uh, triumphant in a sense. I'm not sure that this particular piece qualified as dreadful, but still, you know, it's something that I wanted to have there. It's also one of the rare pieces that features acoustic guitar in Risk of Rain. I mean, there are a few others that have acoustic guitars, but in particular in this setting, that is just, you know, me playing chords and very traditionally tracked and all that stuff. I don't think there's another piece that features it quite so traditionally.
and one last turn on the oboe. I had a quite difficult time figuring out how I'm going to end the piece, but I really liked the, this idea that bringing back this kind of bubbling synth that I've used a lot in the soundtrack and then kind of leaving the last note of the oboe being completely alone and just fading out. So we've moved into the piece called A Boat Made From A Sheet Of Newspaper, which is definitely a wordy title. Maybe not as elegant, but I really, really wanted to use something from the opening of Stephen King's It. Not because it was, you know, the movie that came out recently. I'm a huge Stephen King fan. It's one of the very, very few books that I've read that has actually scared me. That I was reading it, I was like feeling scared and I like, you know, would go to sleep and feel scared as fuck. The idea behind this piece was I wanted to use this guitar that is kind of bendy and uh, like off tune and kind of shaking essentially and that, that's how it came about. I also like that it has this kind of um, this Transformers essentially sound. Somebody in, in the YouTube comments called it a tra Transformer uh, sound, which is exactly what it is, yeah. Again, the piece is essentially one idea that just goes on. There's a solo, but there's, there's not really much of a composition behind it. It's just it's essentially kind of mo mostly a jam, you know, I'm just jamming with the music. But there is something uh, that has come up and not many people notice it, but this piece is directly connected to the rain formerly known as Purple. It's uh, one of the synths that not very audible here, but you can listen it at the very end of the piece. And if you listen to that and then go to the rain formerly known as Purple, then you can um, uh, see the similarities. So yeah, just jamming. And by the way, this is not a guitar, it's a synth. And this is actually a sound that I brought in from Deadbolt. This is the sound that I use in Now I'm Become Death and stuff like that. It's a little bit tweaked, it's not exactly the same. I brought in the preset that I used, the pads that I had made and kind of tweaked it a little bit. Here it is. So after listening to this go to the rain formerly known as purple and you see that it's essentially the same thing. Which actually, I don't know, if, have I talked about this in the co other commentary? This is the transformation of a motive that has stuck to my head for many many years. And if you go listen to the original, it's not exactly the same, but it kind of, it's kind of, you might see the inspiration and it's the, th the theme from Test Drive 2, a game that I used to play like when I was a boy on my on my PC. A really old game. And I'm talking about the original Test Drive 2, not like some at some point they made like a remake or something or a reboot or whatever. Uh, maybe I'll leave a link in the comments. Anyway, we moved on to they might as well be dead. So there's an interesting story about this one. The title comes from a Beatles song called Rain. Now, when we did Sundered Grove, I knew that I didn't have time at the time to write original music, but it was something that I put down in my notes and I said, you know, whenever I get the chance, I'll write something for this particular level. Now, I know that this level is a bit, let's say, controversial with the players. 
I had no idea about that. No idea. All I knew was that this level had some really funky psychedelic imagery. And immediately when I saw the design of the level, I was like, I know exactly what I want to do here. I want to do kind of um, 60s psychedelic era music, like the Doors or the Beatles when they went to India and, you know, you started using sitars and stuff. So I really knew that I wanted to do something like that. And I was like, okay, this is a great chance to do this. Yeah, let's go. So when the DLC time came around, I thought, yeah, let's, let's do that. And because this all kind of groovy atmosphere is... In Greece, the equivalent of that is the use of the bouzouki, the rebetiko, and, uh, you know, smoking weed and all that stuff in, like, underground uh, places where they would play music. I brought in the, the baglama, which is a Greek-Turkish Eastern instrument. I was really proud of that, and I was like thinking that when the album comes out, all the Greek fans will say, Oh yeah, he used the baglama! And, and nobody has even noticed. By the way, on the synths that we heard before, it was the theme from Double Fucking Rainbow, which is also used in You're Gonna Need a Bigger Ukulele, and it's also used in The Face of the Deep. It's just a theme that I really, really like, and I just want to keep using it. Anyway, this part with the guitars, that's an interesting part because I knew that we're gonna go there. When I written the song at some point I just went there and I had a very very rough demo which I was literally jamming and at some point the solo, the beginning of the jam was me playing the melody from Journey, Austin Winter's Journey, over the chords that were played with just an electric piano. And somehow this demo that was in the game and I had sent it to Hopu and Gearbox had it. They put it when they did the release, like, like those pre-release videos, they used that instead of the final track. And a lot of people were like, well, what, why is it, you know, sounds different. Or, where's, the, where's that version or something? Anyway, that was something that was never supposed to come out. But it's interesting that through that you can see kind of the evolution you know that i literally put down some chords i started jamming and at the second half of the jam this idea of the this kind of venom venom you know this idea uh was spontaneously introduced into my solo playing and then this kind of became the whole thing of this part and I replaced everything. I took out the electric piano completely and all the accompaniments on that part is guitars. Guitars are a little bit of baglama and a little bit of, you know, the bass of course and the drums. So, the face of the deep. The title comes from the very same Bible passage that is uh, out of whose womb came the eyes. This track is essentially a tribute to Dream Theater. The beginning of the track is the very, very first track that Dream Theater has released from their album When Dream and Day Unite. It's called The Fortune and Lies. Like, if you go and listen to that album, you'll see the, the similarities in the opening. And at some point they were even more similar, but then I kind of switched it around to fit the double fucking rainbow motif a bit more. Anyway, from, from very early on, when this track started developing, I had this idea that I wanted to bring a saxophone player and do some really funky, crazy kind of screaming saxophone parts on this. So this, this was essentially part of the design of the track. This track again is uh, on five. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. The recurring number that comes up throughout the soundtrack. 
and has some really funky metric modulations. So here it is. The saxophone player is Dimitris Takas. He's a quite well-known saxophone player in Greece, like a jazz player. He had super fun recording these parts. He came here in the studio. And by the way, if you're working on a home studio, you should know that the saxophone is like super fucking loud. It's not good for your neighbors, especially when playing this type of shit. And by the way, this is kind of a dueling, a battle of solos, you know? I always wanted to do something like that, and it was a good opportunity to do that. So he came here, had sent him the track, told him a little bit about it, you know, how to think about it and what the direction that I wanted to take. And we started jamming, he jammed for quite a long time. I had a lot of takes, but you know, as we were kind of carrying along, we had a lot of takes that went really, really crazy, you know, and that, that's exactly what I wanted. So yeah, I, I kind of comped a performance from all those takes. and then had my own fun, you know, playing against him, so to speak. And then I thought, okay, so I have all this music, you know, this, all this saxophone madness. I really, really want to use it. So I thought, let, let's just showcase it, you know, let's, let's make the track go really, really crazy. So I'm taking out everything. Here's just drums, saxophone and a bit of synths. And then essentially the band stops because it's like, I think we're done, but the saxophone player just carries on on his own. I took this part out of the game because it wouldn't be, uh, you know, particularly interesting, I think, for players that are fighting a huge battle to listen to these parts, but uh, for the soundtrack it works. And this is Dimitri saying uh, spontaneously in the recordings that it's okay, I think we got it, essentially, that's what he says. We got enough. Another metric modulation here. bass solo up high. And one final death rattle, you know. Again, using a metric modulation. Essentially, the piece doesn't really change, but I'm just using metric modulations to, you know, to make it appear as if it's changing tempo and all that stuff. It's always on five. I just really love how the saxophone and the... It's not a glockenspiel, but this kind of bell sound merge together. They sound really nice. And we've reached the final piece. Who can fathom the soundless depths? Again, speaking of inspiration, I was reading a lot of books that were kind of sea-related for some reason before I wrote the soundtrack. And one of them was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. And uh, it's a fascinating book, kind of adventure book. And uh, it's just uh, one of the phrases that come up in the book that is supposedly from the Bible. It is from the Bible, but it's not quoted exactly in the book. I mean, an exact Bible quote is also something that, you know, you can debate because there are so many versions, but still. I really, really like this phrase because it's related to this bleak darkness of the water. When you go deep, it's really, really dark and there's no sound. You know, this, the soundless depths, this imagery, 
is really vivid for me. So this piece is the middle part of the prelude by Chopin. And the reason that I did this is because I was really, really looking for something. Okay, let me take the story backwards. The reason Hopu found me was I had made a soundtrack for a very obscure game that I don't even think is available anymore uh, that was called Droidscape Basilica. And this soundtrack, it's called Hexadecimal, this album, has an adaptation of a prelude by Johann Sebastian Bach. And it's something that I really, really wanted to do again. Take some existing classical piece and really transform it into this kind of electronic sound and, and, and do something weird with it. So I thought, what can I do for Risk of Rain 2 that fits thematically as much as possible? And uh, I found this prelude that is called Raindrop. So it really fits, you know, in that sense. And the middle part of the prelude is really changing gears, you know, from the first part. It goes into minor, it's really dark and very imposing with this kind of repeating pedal sound, essentially, of this bomb, 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 bomb. So I said, this is a good thing to, to exploit, you know. And also, again, because of the lack of time, it would be really a time saver for me to have established music, you know, and just do a cover instead of do original uh, pieces. It would save me a lot of time, I thought, because it then eventually took me a long time to finalize this piece, but still. Uh, it was nice, though, working with such a, you know, beautifully composed piece. So the idea was that I'm going to take this prelude, I'm going to bring it into the Risk of Rain sound, and at the same time kind of do essentially a John Carpenter homage, you know? So this boom, 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 it's kind of like the, the Carpenter sound, in a way. Uh, always filtered through Risk of Rain and through my own, you know, personal sensibilities. And a bass solo here. I finally bought a new bass and uh, I just wanted to show it off. After many, many years of using the same like cheap, cheap ass bass that I used for Risk of Rain 1. This is a moment that I'm particularly proud of. I really, really like this build up that boils here and is ready to explode. So much tension here in the melodies, and it's all in Chopin's music. There's not a single note essentially that is my own here, it's just Chopin. I just decided the guitar is gonna do this, the synth is gonna do that. And I thought this is such a nice ending for Risk of Rain. Here I knew that I'm gonna fade into the opening of the prelude, which is essentially what happens in the prelude itself. It goes back into the A part. So when I had this down, I, I then thought, let's actually, you know, bring the, the entire first part and bring it in the beginning of the album so we have this kind of circular thing. And of course we end with uh, the Risk of Rain motive. <laughs> 